Good evening, everyone. I'm Jackie Dominguez, one of ALF's National Senior Directors of Engagement, and I'd like to be the first to welcome you to the academic debates presented by Southern California. We're excited about our topics, proud of our teams, grateful to our sponsors, and honored to have such an outstanding panel of judges alongside our esteemed moderators. We are grateful that you would take time out of your busy schedule to join us and hope you enjoy the evening. This academic debate is being delivered on the Zoom webinar platform and will be recorded. During the presentations, if you have a question, please hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen and click on Q&A. Then simply type your question into the Q&A box. For all other comments and to cheer on your favorite team, use the Q&A box as well. Again, please note that this program is being recorded and will be available on ALF's YouTube channel for future viewing. As I mentioned earlier, we are extremely grateful for our sponsors. Our national so sponsors are supporting the debates across the nation and they include national gold sponsors, AbbVie and ASI, silver national sponsors, Salix, and our national bronze sponsors are Alexion, Mellencron, and Pfizer. We are so appreciative of our sponsor's support. We encourage you to thank them when you visit with them. Without their support, we would not be able to continue to fulfill our mission. I wanted to give a shout out to those who tirelessly dedicate themselves to the liver patients and caregivers, 
the Southern California Medical Advisory Council. They meet quarterly to work with the ALF to provide education for healthcare providers and patients, addressing the unique needs of those in Southern California. As you saw, there was quite an impressive list of liver experts. We are so honored to have them guide us as we fulfill our mission. Before I introduce our moderators, I wanted to give a shout out to our technology team, Barb Potter and Karen Irwin, and the newest member of ALF's engagement team, Nancy Clemens. We couldn't do this without their expertise. And now it's time to turn the program over to two people who really don't need an introduction. They are very well respected members of the Southern California medical community and beyond and currently serve as the leaders of the Southern California Academic Debates Planning Committee. Please welcome Dr. Vinay Sundaram, who will be saying a few words about the history and format of tonight's debates, including our interactive audience poll, followed by Dr. Jeffrey Kahn, who will explain how you can help support the mission of the American Liver Foundation, promote the debates through our social media, and introduce our esteemed panel of judges for tonight's debates. Gentlemen, take it away. Yeah, actually, um, so this is Jeff Kahn from um, Keck University, from Keck, um, USC, um, Keck. Um, and um, I'm gonna be actually talking a little bit about the history and overview of the academic debate. So this is actually our second debate. Our first one was last December, it was very successful. Um, and there was a third one actually that was the year before down in San Diego. And um, it's actually, I, I would say Jackie, who's actually been with um, the American Liver Foundation for many years, actually started debates in the Chicago area. And the debates around the country have been modeled after what she actually put together. And um, interestingly, the ASLD every year now has the academic debates for the, for the um, fellows that are presenting. And it's become sort of a cornerstone of the um, of the of the of the um, of the ASLD um, liver meeting every year. Um, so the topics were actually chosen by the Southern California Medical Advisory Council, and um, we're going to have four debate teams. the The topics were randomly assigned, as were the positions. So interestingly, the people that are actually going to be presenting may actually have thought they had a different position than they actually are going to be presenting about, and actually it sort of makes it a lot of fun. Um, they're going to be having a PowerPoint presentation. They'll have eight minutes to present, and then there will be rebuttals. The rebuttals will be five minutes, and the other um, fellow or resident who didn't do the original presentation will do the rebuttal. And then um, they will not have a PowerPoint presentation. If at any time the presenter or, or rebuttal uh, rebutter exceeds their time limit, the microphone will be muted by our timekeeper. So we're going to be very, very um, um, much about sticking to the to the time um, allotted. It's very important to remember that for the academic debates, there really isn't a right or wrong answer. It's really about how the um, people that are actually um, presenting actually present their case. And I really want to applaud everybody for doing their really hard work. And again, they may actually have not gone into this uh, agreeing with what their topic was or the position of their topic. And maybe they'll actually come out of it being persuaded. And maybe some of us will be persuaded, persuaded as well. Um, we have an interactive component um, for the audience. And um, there'll be questions that will be able to be presented um, by the audience throughout the, the evening. Um, and you can um, cheer for your favorite um, team as they and, and post messages as you want on the question and answer area. Um, the, uh, the chat function will not be in um, will be not be available, but the Q and A um, area is here for your use. So we want to um, really acknowledge all the hard work of the teams, the mentors, the um, sponsors, the judges, the timekeepers, the technology people that really helped us put this whole thing together. And really, we want to thank everybody for um, coming together this evening. Um, I mentioned last year when we did this that I think in this sort of era of COVID, it's really, really important to sort of get together and have community. And I think this actually has enhanced that. And I think we've had a very close um, collegial relationship between all the different programs in Southern California. And I think this really gives us an opportunity to sort of enhance it. And I'm really hoping that next year we can actually do this in person. 
Um, so now I want to um, turn this over to um, Dr. Ganesh Sundaram from um, Cedars, who's going to sort of talk about the, the next um, issues um, regarding the evening, including fundraising for the American Lunar Foundation. Thank you very much, Jeff. So um, I agree uh, completely with a lot of the sentiments Jeff had made, in particular, the idea that there really is no winner and loser. We're here to debate our opinions um, based on our interpretation of the literature and how we would approach patients, which everybody has a different approach to each different patient and no, no two patients are the same. So that's the most important thing to get across is that yes, there are technically winners and losers, but really this is meant to be a way to learn from each other in, in, a, in a manner that's supposed to be fun. Now, as many of you know, the American Liver Foundation is celebrating its 45th year and the American Liver Foundation continues to remain very strong and resilient, not only as a source for education and for um, engagement with the medical community, but also with regards to patient advocacy. Uh, they also continue to be active with regards to fundraising, um, in including events such as walks, marathons, um, cuisine for a cause, and, um, and direct to patient educational programs. In addition to that, they have a helpline for which patients can call, um, as well as a website for which patients can be connected to um, providers who uh, may provide care for liver disease. Um, the ALF takes a leadership role in advocating on behalf of the millions of Americans living with liver disease and maintaining a reputation for serving as a patient voice. The American Liver Foundation is a not-for-profit organization and relies heavily on donations in order to carry out their mission. So please be generous if you can and help the ALF to continue to provide resources to the patients, the healthcare community, and to the providers and caregivers. And also keep in mind the date for the ALF's 45th uh, anniversary Legacy Gala on October 21st, which they will, for which they will share more details. Also, if you're active on social media, feel free to tweet about tonight's debate. It's um, at ALF Debates. And then before I um, give this back over to uh, Dr. Khan, to introduce the first debate, I'd like to briefly introduce our judges for tonight. For the first debate, we have um, Dr. Danielle Brandman from UCSF Medical Center, Dr. Edward Mena from the California Research, Liver Research Institute in Pasadena, and Dr. Nora Tarot from Keck University School of Medicine. And for the second debate, we have Drs. Uh, Christopher Bolas from UC Davis, uh, Dr. Allison Kwong from Stanford University, and uh, finally, Dr. Arpan Patel from UCLA. And now, Jeff, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Dine. So, um, so the first debate um, is actually a very, a topic that's been timely forever and will continue to be probably for many years to come. Hepatitis B, treat or do not treat the immune tolerant patient. And the, um, the, the debaters will be Loma Linda University Medical uh, Medicine and Cedar sinai Medical Center. Okay, so a 27-year-old man, PhD student, this is actually a patient of mine, um, in Los Angeles, born in Taiwan, known to be Hep B service antigen positive for many years. His mom and younger sister are also Hep B service antigen positive. He is not on antiviral therapy. No known uh, family history of hepatitis over carcinoma. He has no symptoms, no significant other medical issues, no alcohol use, no medications. His physical exam is normal. His BMI is 22. And um, his labs, as you can is see, are- Monday night football on tonight? Are perfectly normal. Um, he is hepatitis B e antigen positive, hepatitis B E antibody negative, um, anti-HDB negative, hep B DNA is 1.5, million I use per cc. His ultrasound is completely normal. His spleen size is normal. His fiber scan revealed 3.5 kilopascals, which is equivalent to F0. And the question is, should this patient receive antiviral therapy for hepatitis B infection? Presenting the position that the patient should be treated is Loma Linda. Um, Dr. Michael Volk, who is the medical director and chief of uh, liver transplant program and chief of GI at Loma Linda is the mentor. And the fellows who will be presenting are Dr. Joy Lee and Dr. Prachi Rana. The, um, the Cedar sinai um, position will be that the patient should not be treated. 
and their mentor is Dr. Wa uh, Walid Ayub, and the fellows representing the Cedar sinai group are Dr. Yi Hui and Dr. Arshi Vapani. I believe Dr. Hui is a resident and Dr. Vapani is a, a GI fellow at, at Cedar sinai So first we're gonna have um, the Loma Linda group present um, their position um, to, to the audience. Good evening, everybody. Today, myself and my colleague, Dr. Ron, are going to talk about immune tolerant chronic hep B and that treatment is indicated. So today we're going to be debunking traditional thinking and the traditional thinking that patients with chronic hep B should not be treated. We're going to talk about these four issues. The immune tolerant phase does not cause permanent liver damage. Patients with ITCHB have a healthy liver without evidence of hepatic inflammation and significant hepatic fibrosis. The IT phase does not contribute to the development of hepatocellular carcinoma, and that treating IT patients is extremely costly. And this is all false. So the first point we're going to debunk today is that immune tolerant phase does not cause permanent liver damage. So in this study conducted by Mason et al. in 2016, um, they analyzed a group of patients with ITCHB and analyzed two key variables that I will discuss, the loss of complexity of hepatocyte expansion and HBV DNA integration. On this slide here, we will discuss the loss of complexity of hepatocyte expansion. In ITCHB, there is a decline in the fraction of hepatocytes infected by HBV because the infected hepatocytes are killed by cytotoxic T cells. This leads to clonal cell expansion of epigenetically altered hepatocytes that resist infection by HBV. And these cells thus serve as foci of altered hepatocytes resisting cell death by cytotoxic CT cells, which ultimately lead to hepatocellular carcinoma. And this graph here on the bottom of the slide clearly illustrates that idea. On the x-axis, we see the fraction of hepatocytes dying per day. And on the y-axis, we see the complexity of hepatocytes. And as the death rate of the hepatocytes increases, you clearly see that the complexity of the hepatocyte population decreases, leading to genetic uh, narrowing of the liver. The second important variable addressed in this study involves HPV DNA integration, which is thought to contribute to mutagenesis, again leading to HCC. Patients with ITCHB and immune active CHB have similar rates of HPV DNA integration, demonstrating that there are also similar rates of irreversible damage, again, ultimately leading to hepatocarcinogenesis. So the two points that I've thus discussed so far uh, illustrates the fact that IT phase is not disease-free, but in fact, a high replicative, low inflammatory state causing permanent damage to the liver. The second traditional thinking that we're going to debunk today is this idea that patients with immune tolerant chronic hep B have a healthy liver without evidence of significant hepatic inflammation and fibrosis. And I'm going to present several studies today that show that we may be actually underestimating the true prevalence of significant inflammation and fibrosis in this population. So as you can see, um, this study looked at the rates of significant fibrosis in patients with chronic hepatitis B, and the authors initially used the Asia Pacific cutoff for ALT of 40. And as expected, in the group, as you can see on the left, patients who had persistently or intermittently elevated ALT had significantly higher rates of significant fibrosis. But as you can see in the group on the right, in the patients who had IT disease with normal ALT, up to 40% of these patients had evidence of significant fibrosis. And then as you can see here below, when they use the American guideline cutoffs for ALT, again, up to 40% of patients had evidence of significant fibrosis. So similar findings were also seen in this study by Cedar and colleagues. Again, here they looked at the association between ALT and the extent of uh, significant inflammation and fibrosis. And in this study, they found that a little over 22% had evidence of significant inflammation and fibrosis on liver biopsy. So this third um, idea is that the IT phase does not contribute to the development of HCC. Um, but the important relationship between hep B viral load and uh, the risk of HCC was actually shown in this reveal study in 2006. And during this 13 year period, they looked at a little over 3,600 patients with chronic hepatitis B. And as you can see on the graph on the left, when they looked at the cohort as a whole and they looked at the incidence of HCC, um, they found that there was a cumulative increase in eight 
the incidence of HCC with increasing viral load greater than 10,000. But more importantly, when you look at the graph on the right in the sub cohort of patients who had normal ALT and no evidence of liver disease, they found a similar dose relationship between the cumulative incidence of HCC and viral load greater than 10,000. This was a very important study that looked at the long-term outcomes of untreated IT patients compared to those with treated immune active disease, and they specifically looked at three variables, um, HC, the incidence of HCC, death, and or transplantation. And when they looked at the annual incidence of HCC, they found that it was significantly higher in the group with untreated IT disease compared to the treated IA disease. As you can see, it was 1.05% versus 0.5%, so twice as high in the IT group. And then similarly, when they looked at the annual rate of death and transplantation, it was also significantly higher in the IT group compared to the IA group. And again, almost twice um, as high in the IT group. And then lastly, when they looked at the cumulative incidence of HCC death or transplantation um, over the 10-year follow over the 10 year follow up period, they found that at both five and 10 years, the rate of HCC death or transplantation was significantly higher in the untreated IT group compared to the IA group. And the last traditional thinking we will discredit is the idea that treating ITCHV patients is a significant burden on the healthcare system. Um, as my colleague already mentioned, untreated IT phase patients have significantly higher risks of HCC and death or transplantation than immune active phase patients treated with antivirals. And in this study completed by Kim et al. in 2020, a cost utility model was actually performed to evaluate the cost effectiveness of initiating antiviral treatment in the IT phase. There was a treat versus untreat group. Um, interventions were Intecavir, TDF, and TAF. And the outcomes they looked at were cost, um, quality of life years and incremental cost effectiveness ratio. And you can see here in this figure, we are looking at the incremental cost effectiveness ratio on the Y axis versus the, the annual rates of HCC incidence. And that's on the X axis. And the group determined that an annual incidence of HCC greater than 0.5% was considered to be cost effective when looking at direct medical costs. However, as my colleague already mentioned, a prior study concluded that an annual incidence of HCC in ITCHB is 1.05%, which is actually significantly higher than what was already determined to be cost effective in this study, thus indicating that antiviral treatments in patients with ITHBB is not only cost effective, but also cost saving. So I hope from our presentation, we've illustrated the importance of treating patients who are ITCHB. Um, we have shown that immune tolerant phase does cause permanent liver damage. Patients with ITCHB do have evidence of hepatic inflammation and significant hepatic fibrosis. The immune tolerant phase does contribute to the development of HCC and treatment can reduce the risk. And lastly, treating ITCHB patients is not only cost effective, but also cost saving. Thank you. So we wanna thank Dr. Rana and Dr. Lee and um, certainly Dr. Volk for his mentorship for the presentation. And next we're gonna have um, the Cedar sinai presentation. Dr. Um, Walid Ayub is the mentor and Drs. Hui and Dr. Bipani are gonna be discussing that this patient should not be treated for hepatitis B. Right, so before delving deeper, let's focus on our goals of treatment. First, Although we want to have as many happy patients to achieve functional cure as possible, for immune current patients, our focus is to achieve HBE antigen cell conversion first. And the second goal is to prevent the disease progression, such as fibrosis and HCC. And then um, the third goal is to use it, to decrease the use of healthcare resources, such as hospitalization, and fourth, to ensure low side effects and in compliance to treatment. So, however, can we achieve these four goals by treating this immune current patient? So if we cannot meet this goal, no matter how it could, you know, simplify the treatment algorithm or how low the drug price will be, it will still be unrealistic to advocate the treatment. So let's see how we can achieve the first goal, HPE antigen cell conversion. So we have three articles here. Um, first article is a well-designed RCT that follow immune tolerant patients for four years and only 0% to 5% of the patients achieve the primary endpoint, HPE antigen cell conversion. So it show that the current antiviral treatments have low likelihood to induce HPE antigen cell conversion. 
And after this landmark study, um, the authors have a second article in which they follow um, the included patients for another four years and then found a quick virologic and clinical relapse after the treatment was stopped. And our third article is a United States um, multi-center cohort study which show a poor response to antiviral and a very quick rebound um, after stopping the therapy. So only one patient achieved um, the primary endpoints by the end of treatment. And this particular patient actually had a rebound in HPV DNA and ALT after treatment. And during the second 48 weeks, there's no patient achieved the primary endpoint. So after the first goal, let's look at our second goal, the prevention of fibrosis and HCC. So in this rigorously designed course study among patients with biopsy data that are five years apart and serological data that show that they all remain immune tolerant phase during these five years, only one patient progressed to F2 and several patients even regressed to F0. And this finding confirmed that the risk of fibrosis progression is small. And what about HCC? So, um, so when it comes to HCC, two recent studies that shows that immune tolerant patients with persistently elevated DNA had minimal risk of HCC. What's more, um, in another study that categorized the patients by FIT4, um, our patient's FIT4 score is 0.38. So in this group, um, the risk of HCC is almost negligible. So with the, all these above points, we still see a divergent data from the literature. And so from a standpoint, it has to do mostly with the inclusion criteria. So in this study, also mentioned by our fellow debater, untreated immune tolerant HPV patients might have a high risk, higher risk of HCC when compared to the treated IA patient. However, this study suffered from several limitations. First, almost half the cohort were older than 40 years old. So per ASLD guidelines, they should be treated. And second, there's no discontinuation of follow-up period of follow -up after phase change within one year after the index date, which may cause a misclassification bias from the second to the 10th uh, year for follow-up. And third, given that most of the patients are like older than 38 years old and still present with normal ALT, and at least a quarter of them had, had beat DNA below 1 million, it was reasonable to believe that actually many patients were not in the immune tolerant phase, but in the remission state of immune active phase. So it is not surprised to see that when all these patients had HCC, um, many of them actually already had high ALT level, low platelet count, and 70% of them had advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis in, in this case. And a further study published this year just provided further answer. So the authors included patients who were all below 40 years old, had hep B DNA above 1 million and ALT level below 40, and the follow-up was terminated when there was a phase change. And with all these rigorous criteria, let's see how we do. So um, the authors showed that the true immune tolerant patients without treatment actually had a very low risk of HCC after nine years of follow-up. So I appreciate the previous debater's point about happy DNA integration and the potential risk of uh, fibrosis and HCC from basic science study. But those studies are all snapshot cross-sectional data so, so far, and there's no retrospective or any prospective whole study that shows HPV DNA, the integration X exposure, and determine the hazard of fibrosis or HCC after a long-term follow-up period. Therefore, unlike basic science data, uh, the real-world data that we show with robust study design do not indicate there's an impact of antiviral medications on fibrosis or HCC progression. So our third goal is to decrease the use of healthcare resources. So it will be important to see whether this is cost-effective. Same study also alluded by our fellow debater just now. It may be cost-effective to treat mutorians patients in South Korea. However, the data of incidence of HCC in that study was derived from the, H, uh, the Kim 2018 data that we just mentioned, which had a higher HCC incidence. And second, we need to consider that the price of antiviral medication in the United States so since the treatment would only be cost-effective at 20 to 50% of the original price stocks, the conclusion of this study may not be applicable uh, to the patients in the United States. So our fourth goal is about the side effects and the compliance. And we know uh, that lifelong long-term treatment uh, could cause all these side effects. So it will be another offset of starting therapy at an age of 27 years old. And last but not least, adherence will be a big, big problem. So I appreciate our debate's argument 
but in the reality, it will be extremely challenging to ensure the compliance for decades. So these patients are like young, unlike HIV, IBD patients, they may already have uh, experienced some um, disease uh, manifestation. They also have um, need to get long-term treatment. However, most of the immune patients may not have experienced the flare of the disease and they may have also suffered from the adverse uh, effects of the long-term use. So uh, plus they are mobile, they are young and they may have competing priorities and likely will not be compliant. And non-adherence can cause a quick virologic rebound, HPV flare, drug resistance. So in conclusion, our patients have a low risk of HG, uh, HPE engine syndrome conversion, fibrosis, HCC, the poor response to the treatment and quick rebound after the stopping treatment and a questionable uh, cost effectiveness and the side effect profile and can compliance. So we are against this treatment to the point patient. And I know that um, there are several HPV created treatment in the, uh, are in active development. So let's hope for a yes in the future, but not for the current point of view yet. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you very much for that discussion. And now we're going to go to the Cedars, I mean, I'm sorry, to the Loma Linda um, rebuttal. So we get five minutes for rebuttal. And I must say, I think the rebuttal is actually a bit trickier than the original presentation because the people that, that are doing the rebuttal are going to be discussing not only the issues that they had talked about, but also the, the issues that came up that maybe they're a little bit surprised about. So take it away, Loma Linda. So my opponent has made several arguments as to why patients in the IT phase should not be treated. Um, and I'm going to hopefully uh, refute a few of these um, points that have been made. So this idea that the rates of virologic response and seroconversion are specifically low in the IT phase is a little misleading, mostly because the current studies we have evaluating the efficacy of antivirals um, in the IT phase are not really comparable to chronic hep B in other phases. What I particularly mean by this is that when you look at the primary endpoints in the studies looking at um, the efficacy of antivirals in the IT phase, and they really looked at the response rates off therapy, while in other studies, um, they looked at response rates on therapy. But when you actually look at the rates of virologic response and seroconversion, there have been some favorable results. So as we already know, long-term studies with Entecavir, TDF, and TAF have shown pretty good uh, virologic response rates up to 70 to 90 percent at up to nine or up to eight years. But when you look at the data um, for the treatment in the IT phase, as I mentioned previously, there have been some favorable responses. For example, there are two studies in particular that I wanted to mention. So one was by Feld and one was by Rosenthal. And in these patients who were treated with Entecavir and Peganeferon, they actually had response rates of up to 75 to 100 percent while on treatment at one year. And then Chan and Collins also show that there were viral response rates between 75 and 55 and 75 percent at four years. Um, so in the scheme of things, these virologic response rates are not insignificant, as we already know that viral load has a pretty direct impact on the incidence of HCC and the development of cirrhosis. And I think the important thing really to note is that the rates of seroconversion are fairly low um, across the board, regardless of the phase of hep B. Um, and while seroconversion is the ideal endpoint, it is just a laboratory endpoint and doesn't have the same impact on HCC and the development of cirrhosis as does hepatic viral load. Load. And then, you know, there have been concerns in the past about resistance profiles and safety profiles for a lot of these medications. And in previous thinking, the idea has been that because the IT phase is a low inflammatory state, that the risk of resistance associated with these medications has outweighed the benefits of treatment. But I think now that we have more long-term data on these high barrier to resistant agents showing pretty low rates of resistance, this argument no longer holds either. For example, two studies have shown that um, five to six year resistance rates for Entecavir and TDF are fairly low. TAF is a relatively newer agent, but when looking at viral resistance rates at up to three years, again, there has been no evidence of resistance on TAF. I also want to emphasize that both Entecavir and TDF have been proven effective in the long term for patients with multi-drug resistance chronic hep B with pretty good viral response rates at up to five years between 80 and 90%. 
And then when thinking about the safety profile for a lot of these medications, again, I think the question of safety is no longer as significant a concern as it previously was. We have two large switchover studies from TDF to TAF um, by Lampertico and Toyota, which showed that not only do you have sustained or improved viral response rates at three years, but you also have improvements in bone mineral density and renal function. And then similarly, there have been pretty good safety profiles for Entecavir at five years. Um, so again, you know, safety isn't as big a concern when thinking about treating the pa these patients in the IT phase. And then lastly, I just really want to touch on the global health impact of treating patients in the IT phase. You know, while the prevalence of chronic hep B in the US and Northern European countries is fairly low at you know, 0.5% in Asian and Western Pacific countries, the prevalence is up to 10%. So in total, that's 350 million people in the world with chronic hepatitis B. And these patients do have a high viral load and are contagious. So treating these patients would really bring a collective benefit to society. Thank you. Great, thank you all for those excellent points that you made. While we fully acknowledge that the immune tolerant phase itself is not equatable to a benign or a safety zone of disease progression, this is why we agree with the expert review and our guidelines currently that recommend serial monitoring of the immune tolerant patient every three to six months. To the most recent rebuttal points made by the Loma Linda team, it is unclear how long we would treat this patient and what our true endpoints are, as you pointed out. The importance, however, is a sustained response off therapy and not necessarily on therapy, because while on therapy, we're presuming that patients must be very compliant, which as my teammate pointed out, has severe difficulties given the young age of this patient and the side effect profile. As you pointed out, while the side effect profile of drugs on the market at this point in time have improved, even with TAF, our side effect profile data is only for about 10 to 12 years of follow-up. And to commit our 27-year-old patient to a lifelong um, you know, medication regimen seems a bit presumptive. Looking back at the points that were made by the initial uh, team, for, with regards to DNA integration, we know that DNA integration actually occurs at the onset of infection, typically within five days of infection. So for our case vignette patient, who likely got infected with DNA from hepatitis B 27 years ago, does preventing further integration with therapy really provide any difference in clinical outcomes since the risk of HCC is minimal already? Additionally, as we look at the rates of HCC, the reveal study had been mentioned. However, I'd like to point out a key limitation in that study where only 15% of those patients that were studied were truly E antigen positive, and most patients were actually E antigen negative. So those results cannot be extrapolated to our patient in our case vignette and immune tolerant phase patients in general. Additionally, the median age studied in that study was 45 years. So at this point in time, based on our current guidelines, those patients would have met uh, guidelines for treatment anyways. There have been several studies since then that support the idea of no significant increased risk of HCC in the immune tolerant patient. Lee et al. published a study in Clinical and Translational Gastroenterology in 2020. And while it was an observational study with a follow-up time of about six years, there were no cases of hepatocellular carcinoma reported in the immune tolerant phase group with a DNA level above 1 million copies, which is specifically applicable to our patient at hand. And as limitations were pointed out with the REVEAL study, this particular study did have the stringent immune tolerant phase criteria, um, unlike the Kim et al. study that was published in GUT 2018. Additionally, further studies, such as those published in 2021 in the European Journal of Internal Medicine, also noted that no patients in an untreated immune tolerant group with a follow-up time of about five years developed hepatocellular carcinoma compared to those in the treatment group. Looking at the cost effectiveness that was brought up by the other team, the Kim et al. study in 2020 published in hepatology that did note the cost effectiveness was limited to the Korean population. When we look at cost effectiveness in the United States, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio increases to about 275,847 quality adjusted life years which is significantly above the $100,000 threshold that we would typically utilize in the United States to determine cost effectiveness. 
Additionally, in that Korean-based study, the cost-effectiveness threshold used was 20,000 quality-adjusted life years. So therefore, we do not determine that in the United States for our patient in conversation, that cost-effectiveness is an argument that would support treatment at this time. When we look also at the fibrosis risk, we would not recommend treatment for various reasons, as my colleague had mentioned earlier. But ultimately at this time, the consensus is not to treat our patients that are in the immune tolerant phase due to the low risk of HCC, the low rates of fibrosis, the lack of cost effectiveness, and the long-term commitment to a medication with a side effect profile that does not have extensive data and that would require high compliance rates. Thank you. Thank you very much for the rebuttal. And um, I want to remind the audience that um, if poll questions come across, please answer them. And now we're going to open it up to questions from our judges, Dr. Kwong from Stanford and Dr. Chiro from USC. So welcome. Hi, congratulations to both of the debate teams. You have both uh, provided some excellent arguments and have done a wonderful job. So congratulations to you both. Um, my question is for the CEDARS team, for Dr. Vapani and Dr. Yeo. Um, now, one thing you didn't address, and it wasn't really stated in the case, is that you know the, we don't know anything about this patient's um, sexual behavior. Um, now, if this patient is sexually active, um, does that change your, uh, your decision making around treating these patients or uh, if they're engaging in other uh, behaviors from a public health perspective, would that change uh, the way that you think? In regards to that, we would still not advocate for treatment. Of course, if the patient was um, HIV positive, we're looking at a different patient than that, which was discussed in our case vignette. But, um, you know, Right now, we would not, because of the risk of resistance that um, the patient would then harbor if we continued lifelong therapy. And and that points to this, yeah, uh, for this patient, he should receive regular follow-up. He should receive uh, HPV vaccination. And uh, by, uh, so we do not have enough evidence to support the treatment for this patient, even though this patient is HIV positive. Maybe I could just follow up with a question. I, I'll turn it to the Loma Linda team, give them a chance to chime in here. I, I'm interested in this concept of what the sort of endpoints for treatment would be. So your argument is that you're trying to treat with this real focus on preventing disease, right? And, and also cancer. Um, but the team from Loma Linda sort of highlighted the intermediate endpoint of EN it's the zero conversion. So can you just give us your thoughts on that as an endpoint for treatment, since that is what the recommended endpoint for treatment is in e-antigen positive patients? Do you want to just maybe speak to that? So, yeah, you know, I think e-antigen seroconversion and surface antigen uh, seroconversion are ideal endpoints, but I think looking at some of the data for um, the treatment in IT phase patients compared to other phases, they're overall the rates of seroconversion are fairly low in both populations. They are higher in, in patients who have um, an active disease compared to the IT phase, but um, you know we've already shown that there have been multiple st uh, studies that um, hepatitis B viral load has a direct correlation with the development of cirrhosis and, and HCC. So, you know, maybe a, rather than focusing on E antigen seroconversion in these specific popu in these specific patients, we can focus on um, reducing viral load, reducing the risk of HCC and cirrhosis, and you know, ultimately transmissibility. Can I follow up with another question? <laughs> Let me know when we're at time here, but I, a follow-up question really, um, because this link um, in terms of the, um, the risk for cancer, can you comment on the relative contribution of the viral load, which you've emphasized versus the presence of underlying cirrhosis, for example? So are you referring to the risk of um, how viral load contributes to the risk of yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. so maybe I think you, you made some of those arguments, but maybe just give you a chance to again yeah. rebut that um, in terms of just commenting on the relative importance. Sure. So, I mean, you know, the, the study published in JAMA, the reveal study, showed fairly clearly that there was a high correlation between increasing viral load and the risk of HCC um, over five and 10 years. And, and as we already know, patients in the IT phase have, um, by definition, you know, viral load in the millions. So they're already at a higher risk for HCC over five and 10 years. Um, so I think that kind of speaks to the fact that we should be treating these patients um, early on if possible. And having, you know, high viral load, you're having a lot of, um, uh, you're having um, carcinogenesis developing with the, a lot of all the inflammation that's going on as well at the hepatocyte level, the hepatocellular level. So we're really trying to treat, uh, to reduce the viral load, to reduce the risk of inflammation, to again, lower the risk of conversion to HCC. Thank you. I have one more question for the Cedars team, if I have a moment. Um, so one of the arguments that the, the team made was that, you know, you would not treat, but you need to monitor. And that's uh, the, if that's the argument. So what about the individuals who, you know, what's the compliance with adhe our adherence to follow up? And is there a missed opportunity here that could be a risk? Can you maybe speak to that issue of, kind of the missed opportunity to intervene at the right time when you have individuals who are untreated um, and may transition but get missed? Um, so yeah, we fully acknowledge the limitations of follow-up in general. Um, and therefore that's another reason why, you know, we also would advocate that patients with poor compliance rates in general being a younger pa patient population um, that, you know, while it is a missed opportunity, potentially if their disease were to progress and they were not adherent to those follow-up appointments, I would argue that the risk of resistance with them stopping medication, as well as the risk of an HBV flare in the event that they stop their medication on their own without follow-up is greater than that which, you know, them not coming for lab follow-up every three to six months. So I think the risk of flare would make me consider um, you know, flare after discontinuation of medication would make me more concerned rather than them not coming in for follow-up appointments. I was hoping we could hear Dr. Rana and Dr. Lee um, uh, kind of discuss about um, what they think about what is this patient's, you know, risk of uh, stopping medication, because I think that is, you know, definitely a potential concern. So I want to hear what, what your team has to say about that. Um, so one of the things that, you know, risk is, is cost going to be an issue for this patient who's 27. And as our opponents pointed out in their, um, arguments already that, you know, current antiviral therapy may be high, but on the horizon, there are going to be generic, um, alternatives that I think are going to be more affordable. Uh, and so hopefully cost would not be a side effect or, uh, uh, a reason why this patient would not be treated. And then I think, you know, resistance and safety profile were also previously a concern, but I think going forward, now that we have more and more data on some of these agents, like in Tecavir, you know, and TAF, um, with pretty favorable safety profiles and low rates of resistance, I'm not sure that going forward, this is going to be as much of an issue if you were to be treated for, you know, 10, 20, you know, we obviously don't have long-term data going up to 20, 30 years, but data at, you know, five, 10 years has been pretty favorable. So, um, you know, when thinking about safety and resistance, at this point in time, we have pretty good evidence and data to support, you know, treating these patients, even um, given the potential concern that may occur, you know, 20, 30 years from now. What about kind of the psychological cost of taking a medication every day and non-serious adverse related events that, you know, a 27 year old who otherwise feels very well and they're not sure, is this medication really helping me? Yeah, I mean, the psychological um, aspects of taking a daily medication and someone so young is definitely something to consider. And I, you know, speaking to that point in, in particular, I think a lot of it would 
probably have to do with, you know, selecting the right patient, making sure that they're psychologically up for, you know, a long-term medication. Um, granted, if, you know, you have a patient who comes into your office who's 27 and, and, and tells you that, I'm not going to be able to adhere to this medication that, you know, changes your clinical picture and might make you, you know, second think whether or not you want to treat this patient um, in the IT phase. But if there is a patient who is willing and, and compliant and, you know, um, telling you that they're able to commit to this, then I think um, it does change, you know, your, your approach. Right. And I hopefully think that, you know, with educating the patient on the scary and detrimental effects down the line of, you know, you could develop cancer um, would be able to help them realize and hopefully you and the patient can together come to a, uh, an agreeable endpoint of daily treatment. And you can also relate and say to this patient, you know, think of it as another you know, disease that would require daily therapy in someone your age. You can talk about depression, other sort of, you know, medical problems that maybe his friends could be going through just to make it a little bit more um, like um, relatable. relatable for the patient. All right, I think we're out of time for questions. I want to apologize to Dr. Brandman from UCSF. Actually, there had been some switches in the judges, so I had the wrong judges down for the first debate, so I want to apologize and welcome. And now I'm going to um, give the quote mic to Dr. Sundaram, who's going to present the um, group for the second debate. There we go. Thank you very much, Jeff. And thank you to um, our previous teams and judges. And I think both teams um, presented their cases excellently. So thank you again for, uh, for um, the uh, excellent work you've done. Um, now, as a reminder, uh, presenters will be sharing uh, their PowerPoint presentations and they have eight minutes each. And then we will move to rebuttals, which will be about five minutes to state a rebuttal argument. And keep in mind that you will be timed closely so just keep that in mind that you may be muted by the timekeeper if you go above your time. So the second debate, debate is on the topic of liver transplantation in the setting of severe acute on chronic liver failure. And for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of acute on chronic liver failure, it's a concept which is in its nascency about uh, 15 years old or so, but it's the development of multiple organ system failures in the setting of decompensated cirrhosis, and it leads to a very high degree of mortality. Um, the only treatment available in this situation is liver transplantation. However, because these patients have multiple organ failures, liver transplantation may not always be feasible because of the fact that you could have high post-transplant mortality and ultimately may utilize a donor organ on a patient um, who does not have the best survival benefit and in consideration that donor organ is a limited resource. So the two teams that we'll be presenting, uh, the first will be Kaiser Permanente and I'll introduce the team after the case. Uh, they will be taking the position that transplantation is futile in the situation that I'm gonna present and the patient should not undergo transplantation. Um, the second team is University of California at Irvine, which will take the position that transplantation is feasible and that um, and should be proceeded with. So this is a, it's gonna be a bit detailed. I'll try to go through this um, and just go through the highlights. This was a real case, 66 um, year old female with Nash cirrhosis is hospitalized for a urinary tract infection leading to leukocytosis. Medical history is notable for diabetes and obesity with a body mass index of around 34. Um, she has been listed for transplantation with a baseline MELD sodium score of 18. And she's had decompensations of ascites, which has been overall well controlled with medications and hepatic encephalopathy, also overall well controlled. Uh, she had a cardiac stress test as part of her transplant evaluation, which demonstrated no reversible ischemia and normal PA pressure, indicating no evidence of uh, pulmonary hypertension. Um, prior to admission, she was actually functioning overall well. She was ambulatory without assistance and able to perform her activities of daily living. On admission, Blood test demonstrated a white blood cell count of 18, a creatinine of 1.5, whereas her baseline was around 0.9, uh, bilirubin of 3.5, sodium of 134, and INR of 1.8. Uh, her, her urine culture was positive for ESBL E. coli. She was treated with antibiotics, including mirapenem, but unfortunately she became hypotensive 
and then was transferred to the intensive care unit for initiation of norepinephrine for vasopressor support. Her liver decompensation further worsened and she developed grade four hepatic encephalopathy requiring intubation. She also developed hepatorenal syndrome, ultimately leading to the need for hemodialysis. Her ventilatory settings were good with um, an FiO2 of 40%, a PEEP of five consistently. And so the reason for intubation was strictly for airway protection. Um, during this time, her antibiotic regimen was also expanded um, to include vancomycin for gram-positive coverage and mycofungin for antifungal coverage. Again, there were no positive cultures to indicate the need for these antibiotics, but given her worsening course, they were started empirically. On day seven in the ICU, her white count was 12.5, indicating an improvement from before, but her INR increased to 3.1. Her creatinine was normal, but she was on dialysis. Her bilirubin was 8.9, a, a venous lactate level was 1.5, and her platelets were at near her baseline thrombocytopenia of 45. Her meld sodium score at the time was 40. She remained intubated, but she could open her eyes, but did not follow commands. Primarily, she continued to require um, low dosages of vasopressure support between 0.05 to 0.1 micrograms per kilogram per minute to maintain her mean arterial pressure as attempts to wean her off norepinephrine were unsuccessful, leading to hypotension. Keep in mind, she was also receiving continuous renal replacement therapy during this time. Um, now, prior to admission, advanced care planning was not performed. But during this time, as the patient's condition was worsening, the consensus of her family was that they would like for the patient to receive full supportive care and not proceed with comfort measures. On day seven, a primary organ offer our primary donor organ is offered. And this is from a healthy patient who is 24 years old who died from a motor vehicle accident. So I'd like to send out, a, or I'd like for ALF to send out the poll first, where in your opinion, do you believe transplanting the patient in this condition with a good donor organ is feasible? The majority think that um, transplantation is not feasible. Okay, so presenting the first point of view will be the Kaiser Permanente team. Their mentor is Dr. Amandeep Sahoda, and the two fellows who will be presenting are Dr. Luong and Dr. Tekesti, and I will give it to the Kaiser team. Best of luck. I look forward to hearing your presentation. So we are taking the position that liver transplantation in this patient is futile. Should we transplant this patient? Well, we think it's futile to transplant the patient right now. Just because an organ is available does not mean it is the right time to transplant. There are many unanswered questions here. We do not currently have all of the information to take the patient to the OR for liver transplantation right now, including why the patient is still in shock and why patient is unable to be weaned from the ventilator. The goal is to successfully treat patient without compromising outcomes while factoring in the judicious use of limited organ supply. Despite the emphasis on weightless mortality risk when deciding to list a patient for liver transplant, the decision to proceed with the surgery should be weighed much more on the patient's ability to survive after the operation than her risk of dying without it. This patient has multiple risk factors that point towards futility. This question of futility has been looked at by our colleagues at UCLA using our own Kaiser Permanente members. In a single center study, Petrosky et al. were the first to report on risk factors specifically for liver transplant recipients with MELD of greater than or equal to 40. And what they found was that among their 169 recipients, 22% had three months or in hospital mortality. And on their multivariate analysis, they identified MELD score, cardiac risk, pre-transplant septic shock, and Charlson comorbidity index equal to or greater than six as independent predictors of three month mortality. Our patient had three of these four risk factors, including a MELDA-40, pre-transplant septic shock secondary to equal IUTI, and a CCI score of nine. Levesque et al. conducted a study to assess whether ACLF was also a prognostic factor after liver transplantation. And what they found was ACLF conferred an increase in mortality by a factor of 5.78 within 90 days. Similarly, Infection occurring during the month before liver transplantation was also an independent risk factor for early mortality. And they describe in detail the criteria they use to establish the diagnosis of infection on the right, one of which is a positive urine culture 
for a urinary tract infection, which our patients had. They also found that the presence of infection, presence of ACLF, recipient age greater than or equal to 57 years, and male donor increased the score and the risk of mortality within 90 days. For example, being a 67-year-old female with cirrhosis, with infection, and ACLF, and transplanted with a liver from a male donor indicated a 69% risk of mortality at 90 days post-liver transplant. This is describing our patient. This comes from a retrospective review of all cirrhotic patients admitted to the ICU between January of 2011 and December of 2014. And the purpose of this study was to evaluate the predictive power of ICU admission MELT scores in the ICU population and identify clinical risk factors associated with increased mortality. Patients who underwent a transplant, known as the survivors, were compared to those who died, the non-survivors. And when clinical risk factors were compared between cohorts, non-survivors had a significantly higher incidence of infection, hepatic encephalopathy, mechanical ventilation requirements, vasopressor requirements, and dialysis. Does this sound familiar? Well, it should because this is describing our patient. And this was a, an observational retrospective cohort study where the goal of the study was to evaluate the predictive factors of mortality in patients after liver transplantation in an ICU. And as you can see, the time of use of mechanical ventilation was one of the variables that best predicted death for this sample, where each hour of mechanical ventilation increased the risk of death by 2.6%. Levesque et al. also looked at the prognosis of patients with cirrhosis admitted to the ICU and requiring mechanical ventilation. And what they found was that ICU mortality was only 16% in patients without ACLF and 89% in patients with ACLF grade three. And on the right, we calculated our patient's ACLF score and it's three. Her probability of dying at one month is nearly 100%. Agbim et al. conducted a retrospective study looking at early post-transplant morbidity and survival of ACLF patients. And what they found was that graft survival in the non-ACLF group was significantly better than graft survival in those with ACLF grade one, ACLF grade two, and most importantly, which is what our patient had, ACLF grade three. The decision to proceed with liver transplant depends not on a patient's risk for weightless mortality, but also the likelihood that a new liver will reverse the patient's pre-transplant comorbidities. Examples of conditions that will not reverse after liver transplant include diabetes and its complications, and obesity. Conditions such as these not only threaten the long-term success of liver transplant with respect to both survival and quality of life, but may even accelerate morbidity and mortality as a result of transplant and immunosuppression. And up to 46% of patients will develop post-liver transplant metabolic syndrome with the greatest risk seen in those with a BMI of 30 or greater pre-liver transplant. And as a reminder, our patient was diabetic and her BMI was 34. I wanna remind everyone of the four pillars of medical ethics because this is what we should be thinking about in this case. Justice, there must be a fair policy and system for all patients to be considered for liver transplantation. Beneficence, a transplant should contribute to a patient's welfare. Autonomy, respect for persons to make decisions about their own body. And finally, non-maleficence, do no harm. Patients should not be exposed to unnecessary harms. This is a difficult scenario. It will feel hard to be satisfied with the final decision, but a decision must be made bearing in mind these pillars of medical ethics. So to review, our patient is 66 years old. She has multiple comorbidities. She's intubated. She's on pressors. She's on dialysis. She's encephalopathic. Let me be clear. We are not saying no to transplant forever, but we are saying we should not take the current organ offer, given what we know so far. There will be other offers. She would benefit from further workup of her ongoing shock, including ruling out cardiogenic shock, adrenal insufficiency, and evaluation for other potential infections, given the severe consequences of missing these diagnoses. She should be maximally optimized medically to treat her hepatic encephalopathy in order to give her a chance at extubation. We would want to maximize her potential benefit from liver transplantation. This is a hard decision, but we cannot afford to make the wrong decision. It's not just her life that hangs in the balance. Someone else needs that liver too. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed that presentation. So um, to present a different point of view will be the team from UC Irvine, which will present the position that transplantation is feasible in this patient and that the organ should be accepted. The, um, the two mentors from the UC Irvine team will be Dr. Kechin, Kechin Hu and Dr. Lydia, Lydia A. And the two fellows presenting will be Dr. Han and Dr. Kim. And I will um, let the UC Irvine team proceed. I look forward to your presentation as well. Uh, thank you to our mentors, Dr. A and Dr. Hu. Um, our stance is that liver transplantation in a patient with severe acute on chronic liver failure is indeed feasible. So just to go over quickly the definitions of acute on chronic liver failure, it's graded from no acute on chronic liver failure to three based on the European definition. And that is the one we'll be using for this uh, presentation today. So defining organ failure, as my opponent has previously described, this patient has multiple organ failures, including kidney failure, uh, brain failure, coagulation failure, and and uh, circulatory failure as by the use of vasopressors. And also she has liver dysfunction as well. So why should this patient get a transplant? Well, first of all, she is 66 years old and she has good baseline performance and functional status. She has good social support with an actively involved family. She has presumed reliability and compliance, although this is not directly stated in the case. She is you know, listed already and she has a liver offered within seven days of presentation. And she has no relative contraindications to transplant. She does not have cancer. She doesn't have chronic alcohol or drug abuse. She doesn't have uncontrolled infection or sepsis. She has no uncontrolled GI bleed. And she has no major medical comorbidities such as severe heart failure or severe lung failure or dementia. And most importantly, there's extremely high short-term mortality without a transplant as we will soon see. So the question we asked is what will happen if no transplant is performed? So there is an abundance of data that really shows that worse with worsening outcomes with increasing ACLF grade if no transplant is performed. Um, based on our case as described, she has ACLF3, which as you can see here, carries a 28 day mortality of almost 96%. And in this uh, slide here, we're looking at the analysis of the canonic study that looked at the probability of transplants to free survival based on ACLF grade over time. And as you can see here that um, at all time points, those with ACLF3 uh, have the lowest probability of transplant free survival with the biggest drop in rate happening within the first 28 days. So then the next question we asked was, well, if we transplant her, what is her survival probability? And there's been many studies that looked at different data sets. And the first one we'll go over is the North American Consortium data set that looked at 768 patients in North America uh, listed for transplants. And what they found was, again, without a transplant and for organ failures, the three month mortality is 100%. And using but when you look at what happens if you do transplant, when using the North American definition for ACLF, which is simply two or more organ failures, the 94% three months survival, uh, there's 94% three months survival and 93% six months survival. And there is no difference between three and six months survival. So these are extremely positive numbers. Um, there have been several other studies that looked at the UNOS database, including uh, several studies by our uh, wonderful moderator here. Um, for this one is by Dr. Sundaram that looked at uh, 50,000 patients who got transplanted uh, between 2005 and 2016. And they found that, yes, indeed, there are certain factors that did decrease one year post transplant survival rates. One of them is mechanical ventilation, as you can see here. Those who were mechanically ventilated had about a 75.3 one year survival rate versus those who are not mechanically ventilated. And while this is a decrease. It must be noted that the absolute value of 75.3 is still a very good number for a survival rate. And furthermore, the UNOS database doesn't stratify between 
respiratory fail or a resp they classify respiratory failure as simply being on a ventilator, but we don't know if they're on a ventilator because of true respiratory failure as defined by a low PAFIO2, or if it's respiratory failure as uh, due to hepatic encephalopathy. Um, in the same study, they also looked at how ACLF grade affected survival. And it is true that as ACLF grade goes high, higher, the survival rate drops, um, drops a lower as well. However, again, the absolute survival rate of 81.8% per, uh, percent for ACLF3 is extremely high still. When they performed the multivariable analysis, they found two factors that negatively impacted mortality or positively impacted mortality rate, I guess. Um, first one was the donor risk index of greater than 1.7. For our patient, this doesn't really apply because her donor is a relatively healthy 24 year old male. So his donor risk index is most likely going to be less than 1.7. And the other one is mechanical vent ventilation. And as I said earlier, um, this, the UNOS database is unable to determine whether this is due to hepatic encephalopathy or due to true respiratory failure. So then let's take a look at what happens if you look at just a number of organ failures itself instead of using ACLF grade. And in this study of that same UNOS database by Tulavath, uh, what they found was that as the number of organs failed, the survival probability did drop. But again, looking at the worst of, worst of cases, even if you have five to six organ failures, your survival is still uh, over 80% at one year with the transplant. And then if you look at the same data, but then categorize everything into the type of organ failure, um, you can see that the difference between, between the um, survival probabilities is a little bit less in, the, in, this, uh, in this case. And with the worst being respiratory failure leading to the lowest survival probability. And again, this database doesn't distinguish between um, uh, respiratory failure due to hepatic encephalopathy versus true respiratory failure. Um, if you need more data on what the survival rate is after transplant in these patients, um, more recently, there was another retrospective study uh, called the ALITA study that included some 308 patients with uh, ACLF listed from in Europe from 2018 to 2019. And they found pretty much the same results that yes, as your ACLA grade, ACLF grade goes up, your survival probability goes down. But the absolute value of the survival probabilities, it's still very high, almost 80% for ACLF grade three and slightly above 80% for ACLF grade, uh, for three or more organ failures. So then we asked the question, well, is this the timing optimal for transplant at this time? And so in this graph, you can see here that uh, those who have ACLF grade three who were, had a transplant in less than seven days did significantly better than those with ACLF grade three and who had to wait longer than seven days. And in our patient, uh, she, she already has a liver transplant offered at seven days. So then we asked, well, should we wait for her to cl clinically improve? But she does have encephalopathy that may or may not be optimally managed. She does have a need for low dose pressors. And well, well then we had to, wanted to ask, well, will she improve? Um, so sh should we wait for, for clinical improvement? Well, if you look at the data, very few patients actually improve from ACLF3. Um, I will defer back to the uh, Kaiser team. I believe this will be Dr. Luong who will provide the rebuttal to um, the presentation that UCI made. I would uh, first like to acknowledge the points that our opponents from UC Irvine have made tonight. Um, and I'd like to spend a few minutes offering some counter arguments to the points that they've made. Um, I think in general, right, what we have to do right now is look at the situation at this very moment and the clinical presentation that this patient is in at this moment of transplant offer. Um, this is not the same patient that came into the hospital seven days ago and had been previously listed for liver transplant at a better functional status, at a better health status. Um, one of the arguments made by our opponents touched based about ventilatory status and the outcomes based on ventilation and how they 
or not delineated between hepatic encephalopathy and true respiratory failure. Um, my colleague, Dr. Tikesi, did argue a point in that fact in that uh, studies have shown that patients being ventilated in general, despite being uh, mechanically ventilated for respiratory failure or PSC, um, each hour of mechanical, mechanical ventilation regardless increases risk of death by 2%. So it doesn't matter you know, why she's being ventilated, just being ventilated itself will put her at higher risk for mortality. And what I would also like to point out is um, one of the arguments is that she does not have any relative contraindications for transplant this moment because she does not have widespread sepsis. I would say at this point, we're not really sure what's going on. She does remain on pressors. And despite being treated for UTI, she is now on antifungals, which um, within seven days, cultures may not be able to show a true active fungal infection. And if she does in fact have some sort of widespread infection that we are not aware of at this moment, um, that would be definitely a contraindication for transplantation. Um, I think what we should now acknowledge overall is the overwhelming disparity that we have in our region and nationally for the need of transplant versus the shortage of organs. Uh, this has been leading to an ongoing debate about efficacious allocation. And we know that patients um, benefit from liver transplants, um, but this must be balanced with the current supply of organs. I wanted to point out that last year in the state of California, about 200 patients died while waiting on the wait list for liver transplantation because of the shortage of these organs. And ultimately we have to give transplants to those who have the greatest chance of survival. In the United States, the average one-year survival for those receiving a transplant is about 88%. And studies that have been mentioned um, this evening, in term, including the canonic study, who were looking at patients getting transplanted at time of acute and chronic liver failure, the one-year probability of the survival was 75%, which is much lower than the national average of 88%. Uh, similarly, other um, research studies have shown that patients who are transplanted at the time of requirement requiring me mechanical ventilation and pressors, their one-year survival is 46%. And our patient had both of those criteria. Um, I think knowing this, we really should start focusing our efforts to support the patient through this time of illness and helping her family understand the situation at hand. Um, Families often report different perceptions of how sick their loved ones are in comparison to what we know as the medical team. They often feel that prolonging life is really the only option that they have. Um, a study looking at patients who died during an index hospitalization, 96% um, of families believe that their loved ones had a 75% chance of making it out of the hospital. So I think as the hepatology team, it's really imperative for us to discuss with the family the best case scenario versus the worst or the most likely scenario. And are there trade-offs that the patient is willing to make in order to live, including having a poor quality of life? Um, and at, at this time, our team believes that not only is transplantation futile, but it would not be a bridge to a meaningful life. As we know, as hepatologists seeing these cases again and again, there are fates that are worse than death. And just because an organ is available, it does not mean this is the right time to transplant this patient. Um, so in summary, based on this patient's illness, uh, I think Dr. Tequeste and I have shown through data and literature that transplantation at this time is futile. And the potential benefits of transplant this patient must be balanced with the limited supply of resources. We should give these organs to those who have the greatest chance of long-term survival. And furthermore, we need to focus on two things. Number one, supporting this patient through her critical illness, getting her through her shock and trying to wean her from the ventilator. And number two, having meaningful and direct communication with the patient's family to help them understand why transplantation at this time is risky and ultimately futile. Hey, thank you very much. And then for the final rebuttal, um, I will send it back to the UCI team um, and the rebuttal will be presented by uh, Dr. Kim. Thank you for the excellent debate. Um, so counterpoints to our opponent's argument um, is that uh, our opponents would love to uh, keep using the word fut futility. Um, uh, but unfortunately, I, I'm not quite sure they define futility. Um, what does it mean to be fut uh, futile? Uh, just as my colleague, Dr. Han, has shown that, yes, in patients with acute uh, ACLF3 with multi-organ failure, without transplant, 
have about a um, 5% chance of survival in 90 day mark. And that, that is bleak. Uh, perhaps that would be considered futile. However, with organ transplant, um, there's uh, more recent studies, uh, especially by Dr. Tulova and all in, uh, that was published in 2020 and 20, uh, 2020, that's shown that um, in patients, even with um, a, uh, ACLF3 with multi-organ failure, there, uh, after liver transplant, there's an 81% survival rate at one year and 67% per, uh, percent, uh, fiber survival rate. And I would certainly um, not call these futile. Uh, in fact, they are um, more than reasonable attempts at um, uh, uh, prolonging life. Um, and as the second point um, that our opponents would argue is that we should wait, that we should wait for improvement. Um, and as our, our, my colleague, Dr. Hines pointed out earlier, less than one fourth, um, according to uh, UNOS data, uh, database, uh, less than a quarter of, our, of the patients who um, have been diagnosed with ACLF3 uh, uh, um, rarely improve to um, ACLF0 to 2. Um, and oftentimes uh, without organ transplant, they actually do not downgrade at all. Um, actually, studies um, uh, syndrome at all have, have actually looked at um, um, based comparing patients who were uh, who received a liver transplant, um, comparing that patients who were listed and transplanted at um, ACLF3, comparing those, uh, uh, the survival outcome with patients who were listed at ACLF3, however, improved to ACLF grade uh, one to two or no ACLF at all. At the time of liver transplant, um, the, the survival rate at one year was comparable and not statistically significant, uh, which suggests that we should actually not really wait until um, patients ACLF has been downgraded because again, there's no statistically significant survival benefit. However, what was statistically significant was that patients who were um, uh, diagnosed and listed at ACLF3, if they had received the transplant after seven days, um, their chance of survival was significant, uh, significant, statistically significantly lower. Um, so, so it really overall is not very realistic um, that our patient will resolve some or all of our organ failures prior to transplant. Um, and their count counterpoint was that our opponents have argued that perhaps um, there's an ongoing sepsis. I think that um, from the prompt, it is appropriate that patients have been, uh, treated, is, is currently uh, being treated and has been treated with broad spectrum antibiotics and uh, repeat cultures are negative. Um, and although it is likely that the sepsis was a trigger of this acute decompensation of the liver failure, um, the worsening liver failure is likely just due to ongoing worsening organ failure, not necessarily reflective of ongoing sepsis. Um, uh, so another point that I wanted to make uh, was that um, they did talk about how um, uh, this concept of um, beneficence, um, autonomy, justice, and I think these are all great points. Um, these are four cornerstones of uh, med medicine. Uh, regarding in terms of autonomy, you're right that there is no advanced directive that our patient has specifically left us regarding whether we should transplant her or not. And this is a pretty frequent um, scenario that we run into. And that's, but that's why the family is there to help support us, help support us make what would the, what would have the patient have wanted. And it is very clear from the prompt that the, uh, that um, based on the family members who know the patient best, that she would want the uh, liver transplant. Um, and ultimately, um, the, another argument that our opponent uh, has, opponents have made is that another liver uh, will be available. And that is not a guarantee that we can make, um, as we all know. Um, sometimes um, the liver may not be available by the time that she improves, which again, I, my, our colleague have shown earlier that it really doesn't make that much of a statistically significant difference. We should transplant her now, which is day seven. Um, ultimately, uh, this liver transplant represents a second chance of life for our patient. Data shows that um, even uh, transplanting liver at this point is more than feasible and uh, actually offers a pretty comparable good outcome. And we should not hesitate and deprive her of this opportunity at Second Life. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So I think um, both teams did an excellent job. And um, I'm going to hazard a guess that I think the decision as to who will be the winner is probably going to come down to the question and answer session. So um, I would like uh, to, um, to introduce the three judges um, for debate number two, which, um, which are Dr. Uh, Patel, Dr. Bolas, and uh, Dr. Kwong. Um, do they all have their cameras on? 
Okay. And so um, what I like to do is I like to go to each judge um, individually first to ask one question. This way everyone can get a question in. And then after that, um, if you can use the raise hand function, I will look for you and then I'll call on you. Um, this way we're not accidentally interrupting each other. Uh, so I typically go in alphabetical order just to make it simple. So I'll start with Dr. Bolas. Um, uh, if you have a question for I thought you were going with my first name. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. No. Um, right. So this is a really, really uh, interesting, difficult uh, scenario, particularly for me. I'm not a transplant hepatologist, so I'm learning a lot here myself. Uh, and what I could tell from the two sides was that without transplant, this patient is likely to die. The, the chance of survival is less than 10%. Is that, is that agreeable between the two sides? And then just to get, I just want to be clear in terms of the chance of survival post-transplant, was there agreement that post-transplant her survival, either 90 day or one year, would be somewhere in the order of 70 to 80%? Is that what I'm, I'm understanding? Or, is it, or, or was it less than that? From the from the Kaiser team, were you arguing yeah, it would be uh, lower than that, or was that kind of the still the same range? Uh, I think a lot of the studies that we've seen and read and looked up um, do delineate a survival when your survival between seventy to eighty percent. But I think if you look at further studies that delineate patients with ACLF grade three, um, their survival is maybe even lower than 70%. And some studies group them all together. They don't necessarily delineate between stage one, stage two, stage three. And in my rebuttal, I had argued that a study looking at patients not only with ACLF, but mechanically ventilated, on pressors, and that study itself, their cohort had a one-year survival of 46%. So it, it does range, but I think um, our patient in this case really was on the most severe end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so we're arguing that probably her one-year survival is going to be much less than the average, like in the 80s. Okay. And, and so then my question, and I'll direct this to the Kaiser team then, um, is you made the argument that the long-term survival was lower than others uh, that could benefit from this organ and it should be used elsewhere. But the differential benefit that this patient might get is tremendous, going from less than 10% to even 70% or 60%. So how do you, how do you put that into your, your thinking in terms of whether this is futile or not relative to its use in another individual? Um, you know, definitely, I think, Without this organ, this patient is going to die. Um, and definitely having a 46% chance to 70% chance or whatever is better than 10 or less. Um, but I think what we also have to think about as transplant hepatologists is, um, you know, just in the state of California, like I mentioned, 200 people last year died waiting on this list. And perhaps their chance of one survival might have been greater than that. And given the scarcity of you know, these organs, we really are arguing that we should be allocating these organs to patients who may have a better shot of long-term survival. It's very difficult, but I think it's a necessary thought process that we have to go through. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and now I'll ask Dr. Kwong if she has a question for either team. Sure. Thanks. I think both great arguments on both sides. Congratulations to to both teams. Um, I'll go to the Irvine side then since uh, to, to uh, um, so you know I'm, I'm hearing a lot about one year survival that's really like all the outcomes I heard I heard one year survival a lot and that's unfortunately what we have in in our um, kind of metric uh, system right now but there's a lot of interest in other outcomes are there other outcomes like complications from surgery, quality of life, long-term outcomes beyond one year that might change whether we might give this organ to this patient versus another? So yeah, there's definitely other things to consider, um, including complications, quality of life. I know there have been several studies that looked at quality of life, um, one year, five year post-transplant, 
And indeed, there is when they when they do the different questionnaires, the ones who have a CLF3 who have multiple organ failures do look like they have uh, lower scores on those questionnaires, but none of them really looked at what the patient perceives as a benefit from the transplant. They just sort of look at, oh, how is your quality of life? And so I sort of, uh, we don't really, I don't think we really have data for this. We probably need a prospective study for this really, but I sort of wonder if, if we ask these patients who did get a liver transplant with ACLF3 and did have complications, had to stay in the hospital for 60 plus days, and they, you know, has to take all these medications, go see doctors really frequently. If we ask them five years later, if you can go back and make this choice again, would you still take the transplant or not? And unfortunately, I don't think we can really answer that question yet. Um, but I would like to hopefully think that these patients that if they are alive and they can see their children, then they would still say yes, despite everything that happened to me, I will still take the transplant. And then if you're talking about data on long term data on uh, post transplant survival, um, there have been a couple of studies, uh, I think, on one of my later slides, I didn't get to, we were looking at, I think, Tula Voss was looking at the UNOS database, and they did look at five-year survival, five survival rates, and it, so it was like, we, even with five or six organ failure, it was 67% compared to 74% with, uh, with no organ failure. So the difference isn't that big, and I think that's, um, that supports transplant, even if they have some multiple organ failures. Okay, thank you very much. And now I'll go to Dr. Patel. Uh, hi, everyone. I think you both, both sides did a really wonderful job. I have a question from the Kaiser side. Um, so you were mentioning that the risk of infection and requiring pressors is associated with a really poor prognosis. But I wonder what are conditions where you might reconsider that because, you know, the decision for transplant is time sensitive. So if you decide to pass up on this offer, there may be situations where you might consider transplanting this patient if they improve clinically. Um, the CLIP C, so C score is really high. Does that mean that the patient's chance of transplant is finally going to be bad, or are there situations where you might reconsider that option? Um, I think there are definitely opportunities to reconsider. And I maybe the point that we were trying to make in our presentation as well as that um, at day seven, um, she is still on pressors and um, is on broad spectrum antibiotics, including antifungal medications. It seems to us that maybe we just don't have a good grasp of what's driving the shock. Mm -hmm. And we would argue that um, she would benefit from further workup to rule out infection, to see if there's any other etiology that's driving her um, shock state, like a maybe a stress-induced cardiomyopathy now that she has gone through all this that's, you know, preventing her from getting off the pressors or adrenal insufficiency. Um, so I think there are definitely opportunities to reconsider, but I think at this moment with this organ that's being offered right now, probably is not the best time until we can get more data and more information. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I think, um, you know, initially she's presented as having uh, gone through all this workup for transplant. She had a stress test um, that didn't show any um, reversible cardiac issues. Um, but now, you know, we're sort of in a different state. Seven days out, yes, she was treated for a urinary tract infection. Um, but like Dr. Long said, that, you know, she's, she's on uh, pressors, she's ventilated, she's not getting any better, and we just want to make sure that, um, you know, we've, we've ruled out all causes, including a, like a fungal infection. I don't know that she was ever evaluated for that, um, as well as uh, uh, why isn't she getting off the pressors? Um, uh, is adrenal insufficiency playing a role? Um, so I think there's a lot of things that uh, are sort of not addressed at this time that we could do a better job, you know, teasing out um, before we commit her through this long procedure. Thank you very much. So um, if the judges have any additional questions, you can use the raise hand button or you can physically raise your hand. I can see everybody. Um, okay, uh, Dr. Bolas, did you have a question? Yeah, if we have time. Um, yes, we do. Mm -hmm. So, so both of you did an excellent job presenting lots of very nice data. Um, most of this data 
is obviously retrospective data of patients that have undergone transplant. Um, and so there's obviously some weaknesses there, and particularly when you think about the mechanical ventilation. Um, and obviously patients that may have had severe ADRS for ARDS, for example, would never have gotten to transplant. So to the UCI team, a couple of things. One is what sort of additional data might be missing that this is involved in this patient's decision to transplant that may not be reflected in um, some of the scores that you presented. And, and second, if, if what other scenarios or what other clinical um, factors might make you think that this is futile or is, it, is there some point where there is futility uh, that may not be reflected in these scores? How would you make that decision? So it's a great question. So some of these, yeah. <laughs> um, some of the data, like you said, is not exactly very granular, especially in the Enos database. It's a huge number of patients, like over 100,000 patients, 50,000 transplants. And we don't, we simply, all of this is based on collected data, but there's a lot of factors such as how long have they had ACLF? I don't think that's very well reflected in the you Enos know, database. Um, like you said, the uh, intubation, it intubated for respiratory failure for, or intubated for other reasons. Again, that's not reflected there. Um, and I think that ultimately, if you more patients, and it, because of all this like lack of information, there is bound to be some patients in there who are misclassified. Also, don't forget um, ACLF includes the definition of hepatic encephalopathy. That's very subjective as well. And so like unlike the MELT score, which is a very objective measure, um, ACLF is, uh, is, can't be subjective. And so depending on how the clinician interprets the patient, um, the, you know, the true ACLF grade could be higher or lower depending on if they have the degree of their encephalopathy or not. And so I think that um, when you look at it, um, the you know, you, you question, well, is this 80% uh, one-year transplant-free survival truly 70% for ACLF3 or not? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think, I, but I think that when you have almost 50,000 patients that this rate is probably going to be closer to the true probability of survival rate than a much smaller study that only involves 100, 100 patients or 200 patients instead. Um, so that's point one. And Jay, it sounds like you want to yeah. look at point two. Um, so I, I think the second question that you had was, are there any other clinical factors that would consider um, potentially this patient to be futile? And I think the biggest one would be, you know, whether there were any patterns of behavior in this patient um, that would make us lead to believe that she's not, she would not be a good steward of the transplant liver. So whether that is, uh, you know, documented and repeated behaviors of non-inherence, whether, you know, patient will take even the suppressions. Um, and also, you know, family and social support is also another big factor into it, unfortunately. Uh, and it is unfortunate, but uh, it, that is that is a huge factor that goes into liver transplant. So um, I think that in this prompt, we're led to believe that um, that's really not the case in this patient. But however, if if there was actually evidence that, you know, the patient um, unfortunately is not adherent, um, I, you know, I, I, and I think that um, because ultimately, I, um, the main consideration that I think uh, to whether the patient, you know, we should should we transplant or not, uh, one of the main considerations would the steward uh, would, would the patient be a good steward to the transplant liver, um, and I think if the answer is no, then then yes, I I actually would be uh, inclined to think what. Uh, with their uh, with their opponents that it is futile because uh, you're just basically wasting um, a, a potentially liver at, at that point but again in this prompt i don't think we're led to really believe that and then one more piece of data that isn't really addressed in the retrospective studies is like something like frailty sarcopenia things like that um, it's not really included in the database and a factor like that if a person was very frail and this person this our patient doesn't seem like it so she, she sounds like she was fully functional prior to this event um, but a very frail person will probably be a factor for a futility as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any last questions from either of the two remaining judges? Um, okay, I don't see any. 
So um, if we could um, put the poll up again to see if anybody changed their mind, I'm curious. Some people changed their mind. Okay, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, so I really want to congratulate congratulate all the teams. Um, I think you know, getting out there, um, doing presentations, it's a lot of work. The mentors, the residents, and fellows, and um, I think you know, you guys nailed it. You know more about this topic than probably most people do, or these topics than most people do in the country or in the world. And you'll take this with you forever. So you really, really, really. Um, you guys really nailed it. And I just want to congratulate you. And I would say this isn't really a, a, a win lose. It's a sort of pers persuasion kind of a thing where you who is more persuasive um, in, in terms of both debates. But you guys just did an amazing, amazing job. Um, I want to um, thank certainly the mentors, the um, ALF. I want to thank Jackie, who I think did an outstanding job, all the tech people, um, everybody who joined us this evening. And um, we want to remind everybody that you know we are trying to um, raise some money for the ALF, which is a great patient advocacy group. And if anybody would like to donate, this is sort of the last chance. Um, and I really wanna thank Abvi and Asai and Salex, Alexion and Pfizer for um, um, sponsoring this event. And I think we'll send it back now to um, Dr. Sundaram. Um, one other thing, there will be other debates around the country and I think ALF um, and Jackie can send you information the, um, participants tonight and uh, the attendees about other debates around the country. And hopefully again, we'll do this next year in person. It's a wonderful experience when we're all interacting together, so. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. And again, thank you very much to the teams and the mentors. The presentations were excellent. I think all of us learned a lot. And um, just one final reminder, just to visit the ALF website and consider referring your patients to that website as well for patient information. And at this point, um, I think we will go to the judges for debate number one, um, who can announce who they chose as the winner. Well, again, congratulations to both of the, the teams. You did a fantastic job and um, Dr. Tarot and I um, really conferred quite a bit. And um, ultimately we found the, the winner of the first debate to be the team from CEDAR. So excellent job, congratulations. Hey, thank you. Um, congratulations you. to the Cedars team. Congrats, Cedars. Okay, thank you very now, much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and now for the second team, who unfortunately did not have as much time to confer with each other, but hopefully they were able to come up with a decision. And I will allow for one of the judges to announce who they chose as the winner. Yeah, thanks to the my co-judges for. Uh, nominated me. I guess I got it because I'm the oldest here. <laughs> it, this was really, really tough. Uh, both teams did just a, a, a super job uh, arguing both sides of this very difficult question. Um, and we thought uh, both sides made some great points, answered our questions quite, uh, quite intelligently. But we had to give the nod uh, to the anteaters uh, for uh, their work today. So congratulations. But both teams should be very proud of what they've done. Thank you so much. Congrats. Thank you. Okay, thank you again, everybody, for your participation. And to all the attendees, thank you for your, for your attendance. We hope everybody learned something and we hope to see everybody next year where we aim to plan a Northern California versus Southern California debate. But that'll be a year from now. Otherwise, uh, stay safe and healthy. Good job, everyone. Good. Bye, everybody. Thank you.